Now, John Marsden's a man whose name you'll know. Is, he's written more than 40 books, a lot of them for teenagers and young adults. Um, very experienced educator, runs a couple of schools, set up a couple of schools, Romsey and Macedon. He's written a new book, uh, which I've been reading over the weekend, The Art of Growing Up. Interestingly, we had in last week Jonathan Haidt from uh, New York, the psychology professor, and very much a similar theme in the way that we have been bringing up kids and the damage that we've been doing, molly coddling them too much. Jonathan Haidt, in fact, was uh, on the list of the world's 50 best thinkers as recently released. John Marsden should be there as well. John, good morning. Good day, Neil. Thank you. I like that introduction. <laughs> <laughs> now, some of the audience will tell you I'm arrogant, pig-headed, dismissive, uh, narcissistic, uh, all those things. Is that my parents' fault or my fault? <laughs> oh, definitely blame your parents. It's much easier <laughs> doing that, yeah. <laughs> well, that's a bit of the theme, isn't it? I mean, the, the, you know, we're turning out dodgy kids. Yeah, I think given that Australia is a middle-class country, and I say that as a proud member of the middle class myself, we have got a problem that's really emerged in the last 10 years or so, which I would call emotional abuse, which is often just misguided. It's people who think they're doing the right thing. They're trying desperately to do the right thing, but they're actually doing a lot of harm. And a lot of that comes from the fact that they're not giving their kids firsthand experiences of life. So the average child now tends to have a world which is restricted to school, home, the shopping mall, uh, the playground down the road with its incredibly bare and ugly play equipment, which you can't do anything very much creative or imaginative with really. And that's pretty much it. Their, their worlds are so limited and their experiences are so limited that they're not, they're not being set up for a, a successful adult life. Is that because we're being overprotective? Yeah. Do we, do we love them too much? Well, there's a lot of fear involved. I think there's fear of predators roaming the streets, kind of gangs of, of pedophiles or something out there, which is uh, really a bit of a fantasy. The chances of anyone encountering someone like that are pretty remote, given that most abuse of that nature happens within the family or within close friends of the family. And uh, so the, the fears that people have are not rational, but nevertheless they're powerful and they seem to be driving parents to act in ways that aren't helpful to kids. But parenthood isn't rational. From the moment you <laughs> hold that little child covered in blood, just born, it's not. Mm. You know, there's an immediate love for that child. It's not rational. Well, you've got to have both things happening at once. There's got to be rational thought going on as well as that deep, instinctive, primeval, almost love. And uh, that's, that's awesome that, um, that, that love is so strong and those feelings are so strong, but that doesn't give you a license to just forget about being an adult. So you've got to be an adult, and uh, a lot of parents have difficulty with that. But if you love, when you love something like that, you want to protect it. You want the best for it, and that's, that's mm. hard to put aside. Are you, are you saying you need to put that aside and let them fall over a bit? Yeah, what we're doing is ranking physical pain or physical physical injury as so serious that all else is worth sacrificing to protect children from physical pain or physical injury. So we won't let them climb trees or even run or ride uh, skateboards or ripsticks or whatever in case they might get bruised or even break an arm or an ankle or something. And I would argue that the risk that you then pose to their emotional development and their social development and their spiritual development, for that matter, is, is so great that it's worth putting up with a few bruises and grazes and scratches in order to acquire a really much more complex uh, understanding of life. That's the physical side. What about emotional protection? Um, whether it's protecting somebody from failure or downplaying failure or from bullying, that sort of thing. What about emotional protection? Yeah, well, fine. Put them in that bubble if you want, but don't hold out much hope for their adult lives because if you raise them in that bubble of emotional protection, then when they get out into the world and have to deal with difficult situations, with problems, with tragedies, which we will all encounter at different times in our lives, and uh, it might be the death of someone close to us and uh, or it might be an accident to ourselves, but the emotional resilience that you need to be an adult will not just happen miraculously when you turn 18 and leave home and suddenly find that you can cope with the difficulties of the world. You need to expose kids from the earliest days to adventures 
And ma- many schools now, I don't know whether people realise this, how strict schools have become, but there's no running allowed in many schools now. There's no, certainly no picking up of sticks. My God, if you pick up a twig, you'll be expelled on the spot. <laughs> and uh, no swapping of food, because if you swap your cheese and Vegemite sandwich with someone else's cheese and lettuce sandwich, you might give them food poisoning or salmonella poisoning or something. No touching in some schools. All the trees in Tasmanian schools have had their lower limbs lopped off so that no one can climb them. So there's this mania for physical uh, protection from physical injury, which then brings with it emotional damage and a lack of uh, the ability to mature is really badly affected. We were talking earlier about the Masson and Rangers Council that wants to knock down a cubby house the kids have built. I think you've had a look at that. (laughs) Well, good on them, the Masson and Rangers Council. (laughs) I deal with them a lot and I have to say... um, those experiences have been pretty negative, but I'm sure the health inspector, the building inspector, the uh, and all the other members of the council have been down there with their red stickers to get the cubby knocked down. When I was in grade six, we were building two-story cubbies, which collapsed regularly, but uh, no one was gravely hurt <laughs> by that. And uh, it was fun. And I know snakes were a problem when we built our cubbies because the snakes seemed to love the warmth of the cubby. So when we went into the cubbies, we had to kind of check for snakes before we started playing our games, but no one was bitten by a snake. It was all something that we learned to accommodate and adjust to. What about failure? How do you how do you teach a child to fail? Well, they're going to fail every day no, of their how, lives. How, how do you prepare so, them for it? You, you want to again, you want to encourage them to have a go at something, whether they fail or succeed. So, how do you prepare them for failure without yeah. saying you idiot, you failed? <laughs> you don't say you idiot, but you say, well, that didn't work. Let's try a different method. One of the things that children lack is a a range of strategies, and many adults, unfortunately, lack this too. So they think that there's only one strategy when a problem arises. So one of the most powerful things we can do is to get them to think in terms of numerous strategies, numerous solutions to problems. And I know as a writer, that's incredibly important too, because if I'm writing a book, I've got to have many different solutions to the problems that the characters encounter, and so too in real life. So if they... They're trying to ride a bike and they keep falling off. You might say to them, okay, let's try it with training wheels for a few weeks and see how that goes. Or you might say, let's try a smaller bike or let's uh, hold you uh, for a while and you, you know, balance, learn, learn to balance and then we'll, we'll try again and let you go next time. So you just have to keep being creative in the way that you approach failures, but recognize that, yeah, failures are absolutely inevitable in life and uh, they needn't be disasters or seen as ca- catastrophic. Nine six nine hundred six nine three thirteen thirteen thirty two. If I like speak with John Marsden, uh, tough parents. Did you grow up with tough or soft parents? Were you a tough or soft parent, and what the impacts were? Nine six nine hundred six nine three thirteen thirteen thirty two. Is it Doctor Spock's fault? <laughs> he was yeah. all. He was all for the kids. Can be perfect, wasn't he? Yeah, he. I think his Bible of child raising, which was published in the nineteen fifties, I think was a powerful document because no one had really addressed parenting in such a direct way as he did but unfortunately he was pretty misguided in a lot of what he said and what we need is a more enlightened and thoughtful approach and I suppose one of the things that's happening in our world is that there's less and less thinking there's more and more sloganizing more and more shallow arguments and more and more people just yelling at each other and refusing to consider any other point of view so to just take any situation that occurs with children and think it through. And you mentioned bullying before, for example, bullying's a slogan that's been schoolyard bullying and bullying in schools is now used by politicians every second day. And they make fiery speeches about how they're opposed to bullying in schools. But if we unpack what that is all about, we might note, for example, that the bullying by adults is continuing at a pretty uh, toxic level including politicians who seem to bully each other relentlessly and on a daily basis. So if the adults stop bullying each other, there's a good chance the children might stop bullying each other. What sort of generation are we producing then? What are their problems? They're helpless. And I use that word advisedly. I mean, it's a strong word, but they are really falling apart when things go wrong. So when I opened the second school, Alice Miller at uh, Macedon, we found to our horror that kids who were 15, 16 years old, if they lost a textbook or couldn't find the right classroom, would lock themselves in a toilet or rush off into the bush and hide behind a tree, get out their phones and ring their mummies. And if they couldn't get their mummy, they'd ring their grandmother. They seemed to go to the women in their lives more than the men in their lives as a general principle. And so this helplessness and this uh, inability to cope with 
even tiny frustrations or difficulties made me really fearful about their futures as adults. Mental health, I mean, we, we know there's an increase in mental health issues. We see them regularly, we see the statistics, the suicide rates are up. Is this part of the reason? Yeah, I think so. It's very much about the inner person. Because as parents, we're taught to look after the external person. We're taught to feed them and clothe them and make sure that they're in bed at the right time and so on and so on. But the inner person, the person whose uh, character, whose values, whose thought processes are so important to their healthy adult lives, is one that we need to put a lot of thought and care into. So developing that real confidence, inner confidence, inner strength, rather than the kind of glib external strength that we sometimes see on, I don't know, American movies or something, (laughs) which doesn't actually mean much, uh, but a a really strong um, sense of being able to tackle problems and find strategies and find even solutions. That's uh, what really counts. If you could drop the professorial look for a moment and take the (laughs) glasses off the top of the head and put the headphones on, we'll take a couple of calls. (laughs) Sure. John Marsden, no, no, he's leaving the glasses on. Hello, 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 Alison, go ahead. Hello, Neil and John. I'm a uh, property manager and I deal with people that are moving out of home for the first time. And uh, their parents are looking at the property for them. Their parents are filling in the application form for them. Their parents are basically doing all the talking. And then I say to them, oh, how old is little Johnny? He's 35. (laughs) I shouldn't laugh, but um, it's a very common situation that you're describing and one that causes me a great deal of anxiety for the future because... Well, what happens to that 35-year-old when they turn up to be 50 and there are no parents left? How do they cope? They have great difficulties with relationships, funnily enough, because the partners that they might seek in life are not actually going to be like their mummies and daddies. They're not going to be there to mop up the coffee that they spilt or to buy a new shirt for them or to sign the forms or fill in the forms or find a new uh, house for them to rent. It's uh, in our adult relationships, we don't find we find we don't find partners who are quite so obliging. More calls in a moment, nine six nine hundred six nine three thirteen thirteen thirty two. John Marsden, the book is The Art of Growing Up. More calls in a moment. In the book you touch on and then in further interviews you've expanded on your own upbringing, which was less than uh, healthy. Yeah, it was a little bit tough and I think came out of the 1950s where it was seen as a parent's duty to discipline their child and my parents took that to the uh, to the full extent. My father used a rubber hose on my brother and me and it was a reinforced hose, reinforced for boiling water. So it was very thick and he did lose his temper a few times and just didn't seem able to stop. So yeah, we had bruises that were that attracted a lot of attention in the primary school playground, I must say. We had kids crowding around to admire the spectacular colours. So, yeah, there was a lot there I had to think do you, through. Do you resent overcome. that? Do you resent your father? No, not really. I did um, when I was younger, but I went through a lot of psychotherapy and I think I said in the book I probably set record for the number of hours I've spent in psychotherapy. But um, that was worth it because I felt that I was able to find a life for myself and build a life that has meant something to me and has been worthwhile and has been uh, something that I've largely enjoyed, but there's certainly been downturns. Did it have a long-term effect on you? Oh, yeah, for sure. It changed Still me. does? Yeah, absolutely. What way? You, you don't, well, for one thing, it's made me very fearful of physical pain and it's made me more difficult for me to relate to men. I've always been uh, nervous around blokes. And I'm getting very personal here, but that's the reality of it. Because you don't cure those things. You can alleviate them. You can find other ways, other strategies, other paths to take. But when someone's damaged like that in childhood, you don't just, there's no magic wand that'll sort of solve those problems and uh, make them all go away. Do you doubt that your parents loved you and cared for you? Well, my parents didn't like children, really. And so they had a, the kind of, official love that people were expected to have. So they did protect us and uh, pay for the things we needed and uh, make sure that we were clothed adequately and so on and so on. So they did all the right things on the surface, but what was going on inside the family home was not pretty a lot of the time. But that's toughness. Some of that's toughness. 
Yeah, it depends on how far you take it. Well, you're, oh, not, yeah. you're not advocating people be whipped, I know, no, but you're no, advocating a level of toughness. It's a matter of finding balance. Yeah. So if you're creating a climate which is harsh, judgmental, severe, critical, then that's not a good way to parent. But if you're saying no at least once a day to your children, and if you're saying, okay, this behaviour has to stop and stop now, that's fine. So it depends on the words and the tone of voice. As a school principal, I'll say to kids, don't ever do that again. And I'll say it forcefully. But I won't tell them that they're um, that there's something terribly wrong with them or that they're evil people or that they are uh, doomed in some way because of their behaviour. I'll choose my words. I do say to my teachers, oh, if you're angry, show it. There's no uh, children should be exposed to the full range of emotions. So if you're angry at a child's behaviour, then tell them, I'm furious at what you just did. But you mustn't insult them as human beings. You've got to choose your words and uh, and make sure that your judgment hasn't deserted you. I once had a teacher, so an ex-teacher, I was a year out of school, so I was an idiot. I'd never amount to anything. And how on earth did I manage to get a job? It was a disgrace I'd been employed. Do you think she was headed the wrong way? Well, it's interesting that you remember it because those things are powerful and they have an impact. I don't impact think it motivated which... me. It amused me a bit at the time. That's good. It shows you were emotionally healthy and resilient to be able to deal with it. But I had a grade three teacher who wrote on my report, he should do very well when he overcomes his tendency towards daydreaming. And I never did. I've daydreamed my way through life and uh, I've uh, done okay, I guess. So I don't, I think daydreaming is actually a very useful human occupation. Could we go back to the headphones? We'll take another call. Uh, Michelle has called in. Michelle, go ahead. Morning, guys. Um, just like to let you know, John, yes, I 100% agree with you. Parents these days are wrapping their kids up into cotton wool, as I was explaining to the lady on the phone. You know, I grew up with uh, three, two other siblings uh, in a pretty rough area in state. Uh, Mum worked two jobs and we had to raise ourselves, basically. And as an individual, that's just made me stronger today as, as a person. Any, you know, res- you any to- resentment, Michelle? No. No, not at all. All right, that's good. good. Yeah, and I think it's if you've got one child in the house, in the family, then you do need to work a bit harder at that stuff. You've got to make sure that they are mixing with other kids, not just in schoolyard time, but uh, at other times as well. Because one thing about having more than one child is that you quickly learn that if you're knocked over on the trampoline or if someone takes your hairbrush and doesn't return it, then you get over it. And usually within two or three minutes, you've gotten over it. Whereas if you don't have those kinds of experiences when you're young, you may harbour grievances for a very long time and you may dwell on injustices or perceived injustices for a very long time. So you're recommending large families? (laughs) No, I'm recognising the reality that not everyone has a large family. Lots of single children out there in families and that's great, but you've got to make sure that they're not going to miss out on something that other children you're making the point that if there's a vacuum in the family, the child sort of uh, uh, steps into the hole. What do you mean? Well, the same thing happens in a classroom. If the teacher isn't up to the job, then the noisiest, most badly behaved kid in the class will fill the vacuum and become the powerful figure in that room. And the same thing happens in a family. If the parents aren't taking on the adult roles that they have to take on, if they're constantly deferring to the children and apologising to them and getting, giving them their own way on everything, then the children will become the rulers of the family. They'll become more and more uh, active and loud and demanding because they actually unconsciously want someone to let them know that they're safely held and they don't feel safely held if they have too much power. They know at some level that they're not the people who should be making those decisions. You raise a certain number of examples in the book. What do you think illustrates it best of the examples you've come to? You've come to? <laughs> well, there's many stories that uh, any teacher can tell, but I suppose one of my favourites lately was the family who were woken up, the parents who were woken up by their child at 4.30am, and she said to them, is it my birthday yet? And they told me with sort of sad looks of resignation, oh, well, we had to get up and get the birthday cake and get the presents at 4.30am. And I thought, wow, didn't you think of saying, no, it's not your birthday yet, go back to bed and we'll wake you when it is. But uh, apparently that wasn't in their script. Are children becoming more um, alert to the issue? I, I, I've told this story before. My son, age five, having been done something naughty and been banned as punishment for going out or something, 
uh, was found ringing the children's abuse hotline to to nominate me as having <laughs> abused. But you know, at age five, he was aware that there was a kids' mm. line you could ring to complain if you were being mistreated by your parents. And the fact he wasn't allowed to go to the park meant he was being mistreated. Are kids becoming more aware and more assertive in that way? Yeah, they are. And that can be good because there were no lifelines available when I was young. And as a result, I suffered pretty badly right through childhood and adolescence. But uh, (laughs) those things have to be um, tempered by discretion. But at the age of five, he wouldn't have known any better than that. But um, yeah, they are more aware of feelings now. They're more empathetic than they used to be. Those things are great. But they also have uh, great fear about the future. And things like global warming and climate change have Mm. really caused widespread fear and insecurity among young people, understandably. At what age is it too late to help? I mean, if you if you and there's this guilt being laid on us, we've we've stuffed up the uh, bringing up of our children. When they get to forty, is it too late to fix to help? It can be for sure. It's uh, the ideal time is in the first twelve or thirteen years of life. So early adolescence, you can still achieve a lot. But if parents have done a pretty damaging job of parenting when their children are young, then adolescence is almost too late for the parents to do much about it. They can. Improve things, absolutely. They can improve things if they are prepared to rethink what they've done and uh, really reflect on it and really work out some different ways of approaching parenting. But that's pretty rare. Not many adults are capable of making profound changes to their inner selves. So at what age does the child become a, a person, an adult, and take responsibility for their own bastardry? It varies from child to child, of course, but uh, generally around late teens. Mm. I mean, we get the kids at school to clean up after them from the age of five, because we figure, well, if you spill something or if you uh, leave a mess in the toilet or if you uh, drop pencils on the floor, then why should a paid adult come along and clean that up for you? Clean it up yourself. It's your mess. So we start with those basic principles and we continue to build on that right through their adolescence. And that's a good way to parent as well as to educate. Good to see you again. All the best with the book and uh, with re engineering a generation. (laughs) Thanks, Neil. (laughs) The Art of Growing Up, John Marsden.